like to put it is, we didn't come here to be normal. We came here to be who we are, and we have to get comfortable with that. I have a friend in, in England uh, called Nick Williams, who's a great spiritual teacher and loved by many, many people. And We've been friends for years, and we've traveled through India together and things like that. And um, he tells a lovely story that I wrote about in, in a book called Shift Happens. And um, Vicky, that's with an F. Did you get that? Yeah, nice one. Thanks. Um, <laughs> by the way, I think Vicky's amazing at how she does this, isn't she? She's amazing. <clears throat> Vicky loves Robert Holden. <laughs> One of the things I really like is when I'm a little bit stuck, I notice she's gone on ahead of me. So I can just see what's coming next. Because every talk I give is very scripted, <laughs> including that last then, and that one. No, no. Um, oh yeah, Nick Williams and his girlfriend. Basically, she, she worked in, in the city. She was a lawyer. And very, very stressful job, and long hours, and she wasn't sleeping well, and she basically became quite ill. And eventually, she began to get like a little rash on her face. And as I understand it, when you get spots on your skin, that, that's called a spiritual crisis. So basically put, she thought to herself, my God, I've got to do something because this isn't working and my lifestyle doesn't work. So she made up her mind to learn meditation. But she was really nervous about learning meditation because nobody she knew did this. So for her, she made meditation a covert operation. She was going to do it in secret, because she didn't want to let anybody know that she was turning into somebody who's unnormal. So this was difficult, because back at her apartment, which she shared with her friend, who was also a city lawyer, she had to make sure that her friend had left the apartment before she would close her bedroom door, put on a candle, put on some nice music, and begin to meditate. Now, everything was going well until one time uh, her friend left the apartment, so she was able to close the door, put the candle on, and begin to meditate. And as she was about to meditate, her friend comes back in to the apartment and actually comes and knocks on her door. And she says, can I come in? And this is how Lisa tells it, by the way. Lisa just said, no. And her friend said, well, why not? And Lisa was so embarrassed that she was meditating without really thinking. She said, because I'm masturbating. <laughs> and the God on his true story. And for her, in that moment, to have masturbated was worse, you know, was easier rather than to say she'd meditated. <laughs> so, my God, I've just got to tell people I'm masturbating. Meditation's too weird. And remember, this story takes place in England. This is weird. Oh, my goodness. So I can't believe how much talk about sex I've already done. It must be like because I'm abroad or something. I wonder what that is. Anyway, um, so at some point, you know, we've got to stop being so worried what the rest of the world is thinking. And we have to be who we came here to be. True success, I believe, is about daring to show the world who you are and what it is you absolutely stand for. By the way, I was once working with um, another guy, and we'd been doing some work on, on happiness, and at the end of the program, I asked him, so what have you learned? And he said something so delightful that I've never forgotten. He said, you know, in my 20s, I was really worried what the world was thinking about me. In my 30s, I became completely anxious what the world was thinking about me. In my 40s, I became terrified what the world was thinking about me. And now in my 50s, I suddenly realized the world isn't thinking about me. <laughs> you know? Isn't that liberating, though, in a way? Isn't that a great thing? We get a chance to be 
are normal. We get a chance to be beautifully eccentric. We get a chance to be the person that we came here to be. And that's the first principle. And the identity practice that goes with this is simply asking yourself from 0 to 100%, how authentic am I being? And what would it be like if I was to step that up like just another 10%? What would happen in my life if I just dared to be even more of who I really am? And just go for that. That's the first principle. Let's go to the second principle, which is a vision principle. And this is a principle which basically explains that your definition of success influences every other significant decision in your life. So it's important to know what you think success is. Have you seen the Monty Python sketch, the 100 yards dash for people with a poor sense of direction? Because this sketch for me sums it all up. If you haven't seen it, picture the scene. A fabulous stadium, beautiful blue sky, runners at the starting line of the 100 yards dash, runners who are deeply agitated because all they really want to do is run. They don't mind where they run to, they just want to run. Eventually the gun goes off and they all run backwards and sideways and in circles and over to the hamburger stand and the, the high jump and the sand pit. And John Cleese, if I remember rightly, runs out of the stadium and down a busy high street at great speed and he's asked, are you making great progress by, some, by a reporter who's running next to him? And John Cleese says, yes, I'm making great time. I have no idea where I am, but I'm making great time. And you know, when I saw that sketch, I thought to myself, my God, that's my life. That's my life. When the alarm clock goes off every morning, I feel the urge to run. But the question surely has to be, where am I running to and why? So I have a little quiz for you. In the last seven days, have you, number one, gone into work early? Number two, skipped a meal. Number three, eaten fast food. Number four, exceeded the speed limit. Number five, applied makeup in the car. Number six, rushed a job. Number seven, used an express service. Number eight, used speed dial on your cell. Have you emailed or texted instead of phoned? Have you canceled a meeting? Have you shopped online? Have you re-microwaved your coffee? Have you skimmed a report? Have you multitasked whilst on the phone? Have you had your picture taken by a speed camera? <laughs> Basically put, if you just think about the last seven days of your life and you watch the pace of your life, just notice how many times did you do something to save time? And then the question is, what did you do with the time you saved? What did you do with that time? What Success Intelligence aims to do is to help people who live and work in the manic society to take some time out to be able to stop and think about what true success really is. And I love this meditation on what is success, because really that's what success intelligence is. It's a meditation on what is success. Asking the question what is success is like asking what is real. You know, in a society full of front page news, fast track careers, presidential elections, designer clothing and tragic sports results, we have to remember what is real. What is it that is most real about my life? And if we can make a commitment to that, that's a wonderful thing. And I think by asking the question, what is success, it encourages us to really understand the reality and the truth of our lives. By asking the question, what is success, you're really asking yourself, what is important? What is important to me? What do I truly value? What is it that I will give my best time, energy, and attention to? There's so much I could do, but what is it that I will choose to do? Rollo May said that it's an old ironic habit of human beings to run faster when they're lost. Success intelligence is about stopping so as to connect to the reality of your life and what's really important. By asking the question, what is success, you're really asking, what do I love? 
For many of us, we hoped that success would attract love. But I think the truth is, is that love is what attracts success. When you commit to love, you're committing to something that's so intelligent, it takes you beyond your everyday psychology. By committing to love, you evolve yourself in a whole other way that you wouldn't do if you were just relying, for instance, on effort. By asking the question, what is success, you're really asking yourself, what is my joy? Woody Allen once said that um, most of the time in my life I don't have very much fun and the rest of the time I have no fun at all. And often it's like that. It can be like that. But by asking the question, what is success, you're trying to connect with this joy that travels with you wherever you are because in truth it is you. By asking the question, what is success, you're really asking yourself, who am I? What is the truth about me? What is my life really for? So a large part of the work of success intelligence is getting in touch with this question, what is success? And to do that, what we do is we share a couple of different sort of exercises to help people through this. And one of them is called a success timeline. And a success timeline is where you're encouraged to think about how you first defined success in your life. What was your very first definition of success? Now, a lot of people have epiphanies and eurekas around this when they go all the way back to the beginning and remember their very first definition of success because somewhere in there, there was something that was true and important. What was your definition of success before you were even born? That's a bit radical, isn't it? But worth thinking about. What would success be for you next year? What will success be for you in five years' time? At the end of your life, how do you think you will have defined success? What will a successful life have been for you? This is so important that we get to this, because if we can get clear on this, you know, it helps us to navigate our way through the manic, busy, and hyper nature of our, of our life. Talking about this, I want to share with you something called the bell-shaped curve for success. I wonder if you've come across this before. This is the bell-shaped curve for success. At age three, success is not peeing in your pants. At age 12, success is having friends. At age 16, success is having a driver's license. At age 20, success is having sex. At age 35, success is having money. At age 50, success is having money. At age 60, success is having sex. At age 70, success is having a driver's license. At age 75, success is having friends. And at age 80, are you there? Success is not peeing in your pants. So, you know, <laughs> When we ask a group of 1,000 people, do you have a definition of success? R roughly 11% of people, about 110, 120 people say yes. To the point where they've actually sat down and thought about it and maybe even written something out. We ask those same 1,000 people, have you written a will? And over 350 of them say, yes, I've written a will. Isn't that ironic that we spend more time thinking about what will happen after we die than actually before. This is so important we create the space and the time just to reflect on what is success for me? What is success for my life? So this is the success timeline, taking some time to look at it in that way. The other exercise we use is really just conversation. We encourage people to get into conversations with the people that are most important um, to them about success. What was the last great conversation about success you had in your life? And who was that with? 